Thanks, Fred, for that introduction. I don't think it'd be too much of an exaggeration to say I, I walk in the footsteps of a giant here uh, with my career path. Uh, it's great to be here and a pleasure to speak at the Peterson Institute. I've actually not spent time here before and I was just looking at the beautiful architecture. It's really a, a, a lovely building and an important place. Uh, for some 27 years, the Institute has gained a well-earned reputation as a source of cutting-edge ideas in the area of international economics. And the Peterson Institute's a particularly important place to talk about IMF reform. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to add my voice uh, to the long list of scholars and practitioners like Fred, uh, Ted Truman, Mike Musa, Morris Goldstein, among others, who have offered important insights into the fund and the global environment in which it functions. My argument today is straightforward. The IMF must reform to remain relevant. The world economy is constantly changing, and the IMF must change with it, as it's successfully done so in the past. At the highest level, the IMF's core mission remains promoting an open and growing world economy and the smooth functioning of the international monetary and financial system. The IMF must adopt, however, how it performs that mission in a world marked by rapid technological transformation, the rising economic weight of emerging markets, and the increasing internationalization of international financial markets. To remain relevant, the IMF must take three very important steps. First, the IMF needs to evolve how it performs its mission to meet the forward-looking challenges of the international monetary system. Second, it needs to reform its governance structure to reflect the growing weight of these dynamic emerging economies. And finally, the IMF needs to change its operating model to reflect its new mission, ensure ongoing budget discipline, and put in place a sustainable source of, sources of income for the future. And as it acts in these ways to meet the challenges of today and tomorrow, the IMF will find in the United States a constructive and committed partner. Now, as many of you who are historians of the IMF know, the IMF was founded on the realization that the international monetary, international monetary cooperation and multilateralism were essential to promoting economic growth in the post-World War II area, era. The IMF and its sister institution were also created to prevent the insular policies of the 1930s in which countries erected barriers and engaged in competitive devaluations in an ill-fated attempt to gain an edge in world trade. In the following decades, the IMF assisted economic liberalization in Europe in the 1950s and the 1960s. It tackled financial crises in Latin America and in Asia in the 1980s and the 1990s. It helped transform the economies of Central Europe and the former Soviet Union following the fall of the Iron Curtain. And more recently, it has been instrumental in assisting emerging market countries adopt sound economic policies and institutions. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a legacy of success and significance. Today, however, the IMF faces a very different world, where emerging market countries are able to tap the private capital markets, and where the fund's large lending role in emerging markets is in dramatic decline. It must operate at a time when misaligned currencies create excessive buildups of foreign reserves, and when the investment of those reserves abroad risk stoking the fires of protectionism. We live in a world where financial market turmoil can spread rapidly and without warning. And when international cooperation is key, perhaps more so now than ever, to meeting these challenges. It's against this backdrop that we believe, the United States believes, that the IMF must build on its strong multilateral and bilateral surveillance capabilities and rapidly strengthen its capabilities in, in three core areas. First, exercising firm exchange rate surveillance. Second, maintaining openness to international investment. And finally, supporting global financial market stability. Let me spend a few minutes on each of these three. First and foremost, the IMF should strengthen its surveillance over members' exchange rate policies. Today, we see many countries rigidly managing their exchange rates resulting in some cases in trade distortion and excessive reserve accumulation. 
Such policies may appear attractive on the surface, but they have the perverse effect of putting the accumulating, accumulating countries' own domestic economic objectives at risk. At the same time, they foster imbalances and protectionist sentiment throughout the world economy. This problem calls for the type of international attention that the fund is ideally positioned to provide. And the IMF has already taken important first steps. <laughs> Last summer, it overhauled a 30-year-old executive board decision on exchange rate surveillance. And it opened the way for the fund to play a much more productive role in the future. The new decision rightfully places greater emphasis on the impact of country policies on external stability. It defines key concepts such as manipulation and fundamental misalignment. The decision clarifies policies and outcomes which would trigger closer examination of a country's exchange rate policies. And it sets forth technical guidelines that will help the IMF to navigate through this very difficult and politically charged territory. The IMF must now step fully through the door that it has opened and make exchange rate issues the priority that they deserve to be. The fund staff needs to hone its analytics on exchange rate. It needs to provide far better and more transparent coverage of exchange rate issues in their work. And it needs to offer clear judgments and perspectives. This step is fundamental to the IMF's future. If the fund does not act now by providing a strong multilateral voice for addressing exchange rate issues, we risk countries developing their own bilateral responses. That would mark a major step backward for the IMF and the multilateralism that it embodies. In addition, if the IMF fails to shoulder this fundamental responsibility, all other reforms will ring hollow. A second core priority for the IMF involves maintaining openness to international investment. In the current environment, meeting the unique policy challenges posed by sovereign wealth funds is the central issue in this area. Now, we're all familiar with sovereign wealth funds, so I won't go into the details of what they are or how they've grown. For the IMF, the key point is that the rapid growth in the number and size of sovereign wealth funds has important implications for the international financial system. Sovereign wealth funds historically have had a strong track record of making long-term commercially driven investments, but they have the potential to be a force for instability or politically driven investments. We believe that a multilateral approach to sovereign wealth funds that maintains openness to investment while allaying these concerns is in the best interest of the countries that operate these funds as well as the countries in which they invest. While I'm focused on the IMF today, let me also be clear that we in the United States understand our own obligation to protect the openness of our markets to all parties, and that includes sovereign wealth funds. In response to these funds, the IMF is coordinating the development of a set of voluntary best practices for sovereign wealth funds, which will help push back against the calls for increased restrictions on sovereign investments. The IMF has a mandate to promote financial stability, along with expertise in fiscal, monetary, and external policies that are tightly linked to the growth of these funds. Its members have a common interest in the maintenance of openness to trade and openness to investment. The IMF also has existing guidelines for foreign exchange reserve management, which can provide a foundation to build on. For all these reasons, sovereign wealth funds are precisely the type of cross-cutting issue of systemic importance that the IMF is well placed to address. The IMF has already started down this path. Last November, it hosted a, a meeting, a roundtable, for sovereign asset and reserve managers to discuss their common challenges and how to tackle them. Next month, the IMF board will discuss the key areas that will comprise the Sovereign Wealth Fund best practices. We are committing to, committed to working with our partners in the fund to bring this exercise to a meaningful conclusion by the annual meetings of the fund in the bank, if not sooner. The current financial market turmoil also brings to the front pages the third core priority for the IMF, its essential role in promoting global financial stability. Financial turmoil and instability is a global problem, and it requires a multilateral response using the full range of institutions, forums, and dialogues that we have at our disposal. 
the IMF has an important contribution to make in forging a response to the current global financial market turmoil and developing enhanced means to prevent future crises. A pivotal part, pivotal part of this effort is the Financial uh, Sector Assessment Program, or FSAP. As many of you know, an FSAP is a comprehensive assessment of a country's compliance with key internationally agreed upon standards and codes. And it can be used to stress test a financial system against a variety of shocks to ensure its strength and viability. Over 115 countries have undertaken voluntary FSAPs. And this, country, and this program deserves our continued support for the benefits that it brings not only to those individual countries, but also to the global economy. The United States reached understandings in 2006, late 2006 and early 2007, about undertaking a U.S. FSAP. And I'm pleased to announce that our FSAP, FSAP evaluation will begin early next year. Another IMF product, the semi-annual Global Financial Stability Report, also contributes to financial early warning and stability by alerting policymakers and the public to emerging risk and financial market trends. Recent reports have highlighted risk stemming from increasingly complex interactions between financial market developments and the broader economy. This report in turn feeds into the work of the Financial Stability Forum, which typically draws on this analysis in its surveillance discussions. Finally, as many of you may know, recently Prime Minister Gordon Brown called for strengthening the early warning of potential, of potential financial uh, turbulence and enhanced collaboration between the IMF and the FSF. Now, strong collaboration between the IMF and the FSF is certainly desirable and improved early warning a laudable goal. Yet, we must also be realistic about our ability to predict crises. Indeed, our foremost challenge must remain devel developing effective policies and regulatory responses that institute sound financial market frameworks able to withstand losses and, with and risk should crises arrive, arise. As we learn more about the details of the Prime Minister's proposals and others that may emerge, we look forward to thinking about how the IMF might improve its understanding of complex financial market dynamics and their interactions with the real economy. By foci focusing its efforts more intensively in these three areas, exchange rate surveillance, maintaining openness to international investment, and financial sector analysis, the IMF can adopt its mission to the needs of the day. And to ensure the success of these policy reforms, these priorities should receive a significant allocation of management focus, resources, and talent. Now, even as the IMF shifts its core focus, it cannot lose sight of the, me the need to maintain other key capabilities and longstanding responsibilities. The IMF will need to continue its role as a balance of payments lender to countries in crises and as an institution promoting macroeconomic stability in developing economies. It must sustain its readiness to provide appropriate financial support in times of crisis even if its role in this area will be less prominent in the future than it has been in the past. Additionally, the fund has an important role in promoting macroeconomic stability in countries that are struggling to emerge from poverty through its policy advice, surveillance, technical assistance, and of course, short-term balance of payments lending. In performing this mission, however, the IMF must avoid mission creep and respect the primacy of the World Bank and the other development banks in working with reform-minded governments to promote longer-term structural reform. Now, if it's to accomplish this ambitious agenda, the IMF must also reform the way it's governed. I earlier referred to the changing relative economic weights of a number of developing markets. The rise of these dynamic emerging markets, especially in Asia, is a welcome and remarkable development. These countries have accounted for more than half of the growth in the global economy in the past five years, and they have increasingly become creditors to the international system. The IMF must now adopt to accommodate the increasing weight and responsibilities of these emerging economies. That means updating the IMF's outmoded governance structure, uh, which today uh, is more a reflection of the 1970s than the global economy of today and tomorrow. 
As a result, as many countries have seen their relative weight in the world economy rise sharply, they have also seen their voting weight in the IMF fail to keep pace. If the IMF is to remain influential with these countries and relevant to the global economy, it must increase their stake in the institution. It must increase the shares of underweighted countries, and it must decrease the shares of overweighted countries or overrepresented nations. If the IMF and we collectively fail in this challenge, we risk the possibility that these nations who believe they are not being sufficiently recognized will drift away from the IMF and the cause of multilateralism altogether. We simply can't let that happen. Now, the zero-sum nature of this dilemma ensures that it will be a difficult political nut to crack. It means taking incremental but meaningful steps to build on the 2006 Singapore quota reforms, and it will require political will at the highest levels of many of our countries. For our part, the United States is prepared to work flexibly and constructively with the IMF membership on further quota reform. As it has been, our position in this debate will remain consistent with four principles. First and foremost, quota reform must significantly boost the weight of dynamic emerging market economies. It must achieve a meaningful shift in relative weights. To accomplish this, we support a significant increase in the size of the second stage of quota reform. Second, any new formula for determining quotas must give prominence to GDP, the most robust measure of relative economic weight. While measuring GDP at market exchange rates is optimal for the purposes of the fund, the United States is also prepared to accept an important role for purchasing power parity in the new quota formula if that helps to build consensus. Third, calculation using potential new quota formulas result in dramatic, a dramatic rise in the share of the United States in the fund. However, the United States will only seek to maintain its voting share prior to the 2006 adjustment and will forego any additional increase in its weight in the institution in order to provide additional space for the shift of weight to dynamic emerging economies. Fourth and finally, the voice of the poorest must be protected through this quota reform. And to this end, the United States significantly su uh, supports a significant increase in basic votes. Now, IMF quota shares are only part of the fund's governance structure. The other key component is the IMF executive board. Like the fund's quota shares, board represent representation has failed to keep pace with change. For the IMF to be truly representative and effective, we believe the board too must change. The executive board is simply too large, too inefficient, too costly, and too unrepresentative of the world in which we live. The crush of voluminous daily work means that board members are not able to focus strategically on the big picture. This undermines the firm's legitimacy and it, it impedes efficiency. And for this reason, we call on other nations to work with us to reduce the number of chairs in the IMF board from 24 to 22 seats in 2010 and to 20 seats in 2012. In doing so, the number of developing and emerging market country chairs should be preserved. Also, to allow for greater voice of emerging markets and low-income countries, we also advocate an amendment to the articles so that all executive board chairs, all executive board members, are elected, abolishing the practice of appointed seats for the largest five shareholders. We also believe that acknowledging this challenge and committing to address it will help galvanize needed reforms in board practices and staffing levels. Facing reality in this way will help spur the board to become more selective and more strategic in its oversight role. A resident board remains critical to the effectiveness of the institution, but that board must adopt to changes in global conditions. We look forward to working with other IMF members in developing proposals for streamlining the board and improving its efficiency and its strategic focus. Finally, a refocused IMF requires a revised and sustainable operating model. The harsh fact is that the, as IMF lending has declined, the fund's income has also fallen sharply, 
and this is at a time when it's still providing surveillance and other useful public goods. As a result, a large medium-term financing gap has emerged on the order of $400 million per year. Managing Director Dominique Strauss-Kahn has proposed $100 million of that gap to be covered by a reduction in IMF administrative expenses and the remainder through new income measures, principally the creation of an IMF endowment, which would generate roughly $250 million in income per year. In examining uh, these financing options, the fund has benefited enormously from the Committee to Study Sustainable Long-Term Financing of the IMF, headed by Sir Andrew Crockett, which uh, was, was a very important step forward. Now, I'd like to commend the new managing director for the vigor which with, with which he has tackled administrative cost cutting, and also for instituting budget discipline at the fund, which it has long recommended to others. Starting with $100 million in genuine cost savings in FY 2009, this budget discipline must include transparent measures to ensure that these savings do not erode in future years. It's also important that the IMF board demonstrate leadership by reducing expenses for the board more significantly in percentage terms than the cost cuts imposed on the IMF staff. And we recognize that with the fund's mission placing greater emphasis on surveillance and financial stability and less emphasis on lending, the IMF will still require new sources of income. The United States will help ensure that the IMF has adequate resources to fulfill its vital global mission by seeking authority from Congress for a limited sale of IMF gold, consistent with the recommendation in the Crockett Report. We believe an endowment financed through a limited gold sale combined with continued budget discipline, will provide the basis for sound and sustainable footing at the IMF. Ladies and gentlemen, in a changing world, we need to make full use of every tool we have available. The IMF has played an important role in supporting global growth and responding to global economic challenges for over six decades. The United States wants to see the IMF continue its record of success into the future. Our task is to ensure that it, it evolves how it performs its mission, its governance, and its operating model so it can continue to play a central role in the global financial system. Now the good news is the IMF has already taken important steps down the path I've outlined. Indeed, Managing Director Dominique Strauss-Kahn, Treasury Secretary Paulson, and others too numerous to mention in the IMF and the global economy have put leadership in place to move forward against the challenges that we face. Some, however, perhaps even in this audience, may have a less optimistic view. They argue that the IMF's progress to date and the reforms we advocate are too small, too incremental, and too slow to make a difference. I respectfully disagree. To reorient an organization's core mission and priorities, to adopt its governance structure, to update its operating model is a major undertaking for any institution, public or private. In a large multinational organization like the IMF that must accommodate competing national interests while fulfilling global responsibilities, it is all the more challenging. The reforms I have just described are significant, they're comprehensible, comprehensive rather, and they're achievable. And like compounding interest, they will deliver substantially increased benefits over time. These three areas of reform must be, in my view, the priority for all stakeholders who are committed to an effective, sustainable, and relevant IMF. Now, the birth of the IMF was not easy. In reading the accounts of the deliberations at Bretton Woods, I'm always struck by the competing perspectives and interests of the various participants. But the founders were guided by an overriding sense of mission. And that sense of mission led them to profoundly important results. Today, again, fueled by a common sense of mission and a common commitment to multilateralism and reform, we can ensure that the IMF continues to play an effective and significant role in the global economy. The United States will be flexible and we will be practical. We will at times stand very, very firmly on principle but I can assure you we will always be a constructive partner on this very important journey. Thank you.